Well, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to an episode, another episode, of the SaaS Marketing Makeover. Um, we have an exciting guest today, the uh, former CMO at Sendoso, the current CMO at Upkeep, Dan Fronin. Welcome to the show. What is going on? I'm super stoked to be here today. Oh, we're lucky to have you, man. So thanks for making the time. Uh, this is going to be a really, really fun one. Now, as I told you offline, but I want to make sure everybody knows, this is a live show. We do not know who's on the wheel. Furthermore, we don't know who the wheel is going to land on. So Dan and I are going to just have to figure this out. Uh, but I feel very confident with uh, the group we have today that we're going to find some really cool insights uh, and create a lot of value. So are you ready to dive in, Dan? Let's do this. Let's do it, baby. All right, let's pull that wheel up. Oh, jeez. All right. I see what you're doing here, Brian. Brian's the guy who chooses these, so let's see. Oh, wow. He would do really. uh, <laughs> Speak now or forever hold your peace, Dan. Are you ready? Wow. And I love Gong so much, too. Good. I love it. Now, the goal of the show is to obviously uh, build Gong up while illuminating opportunities in a positive manner. So with that being said, let's start now. For everyone who doesn't know what Gong is, in your own words, Dan, wh what is Gong? They are a revenue team's secret weapon to – really knowing what's going on with their with their sales team as it relates to their prospects and, and customers. And it could span all the way to customer success, theoretically, yep. right? So it gives you a way to record calls um, and then track the calls and do analysis on them. It also helps you with pipeline management. I'm a customer of Gong, actually, as well. Um, and there are a lot of use cases. But simply put, it gives you really, really strong product UI I think they do a really good job on their actual product UI. And it gives you, if you're managing a sales team, instead of like trying to figure out why your AE isn't hitting their number, you can actually like see all the calls, all the transcriptions. You can have the call like record certain triggers or talking points or words. And it be a truly good, innovative product. I think that's a fair way of saying it, right, Dan? Yep, absolutely. Now, let's figure out what we might do a little different. Um, who's a good boy? I mean, maybe not a dog. I not sure what they're trying to pull off here. <laughs> um, what do you think, Dan? Yeah, um, I've always been partial to the dog. Um, but I, I like that. I just don't want to call myself a good boy. I guess if I have to click on it, I'm like literally saying, "Yeah, I'm a dog." Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I feel you. Um, the, I mean, the the one thing that I've noticed out of the gate is um, shouldn't they kind of know who I am on some levels? Because I've actually been on their website a bunch. Yeah. Um, and they're not they're not saying welcome back or anything. Yeah, you could do it. You could do essentially a like a repeat cut visitor playbook here on Drift. And then they're also not using like maybe a clear bit reveal or something to enrich this experience that says like, you know, the number one platform for directive sales team, which they could do here. Um, yeah, I do like the, the people. I always thought, you know, they do a good job using people. Um, yep. I like the, I definitely like the people and I like how they, um, it was either earlier this year or a little bit late last year. They, they went ahead and diversified the people a little bit. Yeah, they did kind yeah. of play the SaaS sales team hits on huh? just a bunch of white dudes named Tim. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I like that they've kind of mixed it up, which is, I think, uh, you know, more reflective, actually, probably of their actual customers as well. Now, revenue intelligence. So, I guess this is their category. Is that what they're doing here, Dan? Right? Oh, yeah. Look at that. <laughs> we created. There you go. So, we created the revenue intelligence category for you. So, I don't yes. know. I don't know if they deliver deliver on this promise. Let me see if they've actually changed something here. Because I wouldn't say they have a market intelligence program product. It's true you can know what's going on, but I don't know. I think you're kind of using the product for that more than the product is for that. If that makes sense, like you're trying to make it do that more than it does that. Yep. Are you a user of the product? I w I was yes, and I would you. Would you say they deliver on market intelligence? Because this has the concept of that the product's going to help you understand the, like, the market more than it's going to help you understand conversations. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say it's all about how you optimize the product, right? So if you're going in and optimizing for what you're looking for, then yeah. But it's not going to spit it out unless you set it up to spit it out the right way. It does do these two um, things, though. It totally yeah. delivers on people intelligence and deal intelligence. Yeah. I think market, they're stretching a little bit. This is awesome, by the way. The UI. Insight Squared and Clary are trying to copy them. I've seen good demos. They're trying to copy these like dots. The dot concept was brilliant. People, market. What do you think about when people do this, Dan, where they talk about like their three products like this, but you don't understand if you can buy them individually because you can't buy market intelligence and not deal intelligence, correct? Not that I'm aware of. So. It's always do you a tough what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I do. So you're you're painting the picture of what your platform is, but then when you get into pricing conversations, you learn about the platform, but then the game begins of um, you know, what you get at what cost, which kind of goes back to our earlier conversation around price transparency in the first place. Well, yeah, because if you think about it, right, look what happens, right? Customer interactions, they're showing you, right? We take all your customer interactions. They do a great job of this, by the way. They live up to this promise. They live up to this promise. They live up to this promise. They do a great job here. Then it does all go into gong, but then it doesn't come out in three distinct areas. It's one product that you could use in three different ways. Yeah. But it's, I don't know if I would, you get what I'm trying to say? Like, I just don't know. And this is something I struggle with, with all our SaaS clients right across millions and millions of dollars to spend is like, can I buy a people intelligence platform without the deal? Cause I don't understand if you market it like this, like if I'm helping myself. That's an honest conversation. I don't know. Like, I don't know if there's a good answer to it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but the thing that they've done is they set up the story up top and they, they made it very clear who the ultimate beneficiary is here um, like, and, and what it's for. Like, You're going to get a real-time view of your market and your buyers. And how are you going to do that? Through revenue intelligence. And it's going to be listening to calls, going to be listening to customers, going to be... Um, that whole process through CRM. So I, I feel like what they're doing is kind of trying to paint the golden picture of what the end result is, which is a good one. I agree, but I would say they're underselling their product because yeah. what I mean by that is like, I now have my entire hiring team on Gong because it's the easiest way to uh, look at interviews and you set up trigger words for offers, OTE, and you can do like, think about Gong for hiring, you're Gong for customer success. I think they're more than revenue intelligence, I guess. And I don't usually say that. Yeah. I think they actually have a platform that can go beyond their initial positioning. And they could land and expand way better and monetize paid initial acquisition if they convinced me from the start that I could buy essentially conversation intelligence for my business instead of sales intelligence. Good point. I know it's a crazy difference. I know you needed to start somewhere. But like I'm being like honest, like I love this product. It is one of the very few products I think that's that good, and I use it for everything. But I don't know if they deliver on that in their positioning, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so I think I've like tripled my billing with them because I keep adding new business units to Gong. Now, you're a big fan of Social Proof. Uh, what do you think about these? I think it's I think it's good. I mean, I'm seeing recognizable logos. Right, um, Genesis, we've heard of. Yeah. Cool, I like this. They've broken out. Industry, increase in win rate, 38 reduction, the challenge, the outcome. Seems pretty clean, right? Yeah, real clean. And ROI right up front. So if you're a, a lazy marketer like me, you're just perusing, you see it, you're like, okay, they do ROI. I like that. And you can download the PDF. Do I have to give you any information? Nope, I love that. So very, very clean. Now, let's find some opportunities, Dan. What, what do you want to do different if you're them? Like, what, what do you, where do you think they're not necessarily fully capturing their opportunity? I think, well, I mean, go to the pricing page. Okay. I got to find it so it's not in the menu. That's one yeah. Oh, and they're not going to give me price. They could definitely give me freaking pricing. I know how they do their pricing. Yep. So I think um, I think in this day and age, um, yeah, people have done so much research up front that when they're on your website, like you just have to make pricing just 
easily found. It's it's one thing if you don't want to show pricing. I I still kind of am in the middle part of that camp, but at least having it on the top nav I think is important. Yeah, but they do per C pricing, right, Dan? Yeah. I, but it, I, but it, I pay per seat. I don't understand why you want to lead with per seat pricing. I guess that that one seems interesting to me because you could you could still break it up by like team sizes too, right? Like so you don't have to like you know what I mean you could still create categories of per seat pricing like over a hundred seats. You know the rates change, but I don't feel like they're giving away like I don't feel like they're losing margin and not able to value sell or something when you have per seat pricing already. You know what I mean? I definitely know what you're saying. I mean, in in <laughs> in some ways, it's like, are they in a competitive pricing situation with their competitors in the market? Um, are they wildly flexible in their pricing during the deal process, and they don't want to put their cards out early? I and mean, there's all kinds of considerations there. But yeah, hundred no, yeah. percent. Yeah, because I so when I bought them, I just wanted deal intelligence. So I want them just for this because. I could only see 200 ops in my Salesforce and I couldn't see which ops were being followed up with. And so it was really easy to get this. And I actually use this ironically, not even for being able to record calls, but so I could have a UI on deal flow and they do a really good job to tell like, Oh, like someone responded to your AE, but your AE didn't respond to them. And so it's yeah, like no activity for 14 days, deal expected to close. Like they actually do a beautiful job on deal flow, which has nothing to do with communication. Does that make sense? It does. So it's this it's kind of this product that they've done such a good job with the UI and they've made it so effective. Like notice like it's like sales activity, outbound, inbound. It's not, it's like a dashboard for Salesforce beyond just being a call recording software. So that's where I can see like it not quite being positioned exactly. Now you see down here by role, what do you think about by role organization and stuff? Cause that's not in the main menu. So hit refresh real quick. Okay. Okay. Oh, interesting. Cause I'm, I'm surfing the page on my browser right now. Yeah. As I'm navigating this website, I've hit the pricing page. I put in my information, but then I, you know, abandoned that page and now pricing is actually in the top nav they know that I was looking at pricing and they want to keep the top of mind for me. So they actually have some dynamic stuff going on here. That um, is interesting. Yeah. And they have their blog. Where's the data? I know that they use data because they have more sales data than anyone else. Where, where's their data? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like their insights that, cause their social is, is on point. Like they're Correct. Like, but where is it in their website? I know exactly what you're talking about. That's where I'm like wondering, like, what the heck? Like, they're to me, the whole content strategy of Gong should be using their first party data anonymized to show trends and benchmarks. And then you can sell people like with the top Gong users, you know, close at 30%, non Gong users close at 22 find out the eight point difference you're missing, right? Like, yeah. that's a really compelling product led content strategy. Yeah. So there's an opportunity because on, on their blog, they do have Gong Labs. Um, but they do have an opportunity to make that actually much more front and center uh, in their resources section. I mean, hell yeah. I'm So where is Gong? And it's not, that's the thing. It's also a category, not a hub. Yeah. So it's other things that aren't Gong Labs. This is a miss. This is a 1,000% a miss, Dan. Because really? they have they have the data that we don't have. Let me see if I can get it. See, it's part of a Gong Lab series, but I can't find the Gong Lab series. And who's the guy? Devin Reed. Yeah, see, I want the like data first type report. You know what I'm talking about? Like the, the reports we all wish we could do that they're actually doing, but then they're not leveraging. It's not organized right either for a data type report. It's more of a blog post than a data report, if that makes sense. Yep. Like it should have more of like a scientific study layout of like what our hypothesis was and what the data shows. Yeah, you like read the whole thing—you can't just scan it for the data, you know. It should be. I mean, long form I think is great, but then there you should have clicked into an exec overview with um, chapters on the side to easily navigate. 
Yeah, let me show you. Moz used to do this really well. Let's see if they still do. I haven't looked that in forever. Um, but they used to have some really good data reports. Here, let me see if a Moz local study. Yeah, it's like, see, this like ranking factors kind of thing. Like, this is what they should, like, it should be more like this, if that makes sense. Like, yep. And you can see the data, and it's more of a data first type, and you have introduction, right? It's kind of like your hypothesis. And then they walk through. To me, this is now top 50 local backfinders, top 50 factors, right? And then they're showing like top 50 reasons why deals close based on their data, right? And now they're showing us that. Like, I, that's going to be way more linkable, too. I don't think you're going to drive the amount of inbound links you could. If you if you did this as a better design study, and then it's fragmented from their product, Dan. So notice how let's say I did read this and I was like, hell yes, I need Gong. Where how would I buy Gong in this moment? You wouldn't. <laughs> Do you get what I'm saying? So like they they have this. I think they're sitting on a diamond. I think they could be the number one case study in content for sales companies if they really dove into that thing. Yep. Interesting. Now, one of these things. So the auto enrich, we all love the love it conceptually. Do you think our buyers like like to me? I don't actually feel like I could could get started if I get your like. I don't quite get what this means as a CTA. Yeah, get started. So see it in action implies demo. So I get that. Get started implies free trial. trial. Yeah. Right. So let's see what happens. So I give me a meal to get started. Okay, so that's a Chili Piper link now, right? And now I'm requesting a live demo. Yep. Are they going to – once again, what does a live demo mean to you, Dan, theoretically? I'm going to push this button and someone's going to show up, right? Yeah, you would think right okay, now. See. Yeah. This looks like Chili Piper, by the way, because I have them. Ooh, not a live demo. And then no next step. Thank you for requesting a live demo right now. So I've gone from apathy to action. I've taken a sales action on your site, but now I am in this land of unknown. Like how soon? And then they don't let me book with Chili Piper. That's weird. They used to remember when they used to let you book with Chili Piper so you could schedule your own demo. Like here, watch. This is what I do. I'll show you, for example, because I – what I want to do is I want to increase my rate from MQL to SQL. So if I click get started here, see how I had that same thing? So that's how I know they're using Chili Piper. I want them to select their meeting right now and complete. And now I've booked with McKenzie and I've completed my entire sales process with the information in two clicks. Instead, I'm just in this land of unknown. Does that make yep. sense? Yep. Now it's just on them to make sure you show up to the meeting and – if it's a good fit and you've done a good demo, then pipeline, baby. But you know what I'm saying? Like, isn't that the worst part of being a customer when you like have this product? You're like, Gong sells the crap out of you, right? Yep. And then you're like, I'm ready. And then all the language acts like I'm about to get this value. It's like, heck yeah, I want Gong. And now it's like, well, I have to give my boss two quotes by the end of the day. I was already kind of, you know, putting this off. Now I don't know if I can even recommend Gong and I might have to go with these other guys just because they let me schedule a call. I think this is a gap for all our clients. It, it makes it hard to monetize your paid if you can't connect MQL to SQL in one click. Because you're not SQL yet. You know what I mean? Interestingly enough, so the CTA up on the the nav takes yeah. you to that page that you just went through, but then put it through and the see it in action right off the right here. Yeah. yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I wonder if they're A-B testing because I just scheduled one through um, Chili Piper. You did. So you did do the Chili Piper scheduling. I think they're in a heavy testing phase right now. Okay. Well, that's awesome. I mean, that's good for them, right? Because I think like all this is pretty sweet and they auto filled it for me. This is kind of the OG way. I like them doing this though. It's like a checks and balance to like a clear bit or a zoom info that does yeah. the auto enrich because you don't – you're then like – you're letting like user generated, like you're letting me validate that this is accurate. Do you get what I'm saying? Yep. Instead of Brian, this is something for you to check out because instead of just 
essentially auto enriching in our Salesforce instance and then bi-directionally syncing, let's say, to HubSpot or vice versa. This is enriching, but then letting me validate. Then that helps you with the data accuracy issues while still having like ease of form fill. I guess my question for you, Dan, is like, do you know? I know because I'm a CEO who runs a digital agency who's rolled out Clearbit and Rich product. So I know they can. If you're a common buyer, let's say a head of sales who doesn't have a freaking clue about this, I would argue they don't know. They, they're almost confused, if that makes sense. I mean, it, it depends on how you put it in. Because I used Clearbit Enrich over at uh, Sendoso, right? And yeah. if it starts in as, e as an email and I put it in and you don't have my first and last name, then those fields pop up. It doesn't it doesn't pop up. Here's what I have on you. So it's actually designed to reduce friction, right? Don't verify the information. That scares me. Like, why do you have my information in the first place? But if you have my, if, if you can match my email and don't have to ask me any other questions, that's awesome. That's a benefit. So I, I think agree, it's, I but do we know that's going to happen? You and I know that's going to happen. I guess I'm playing like a little devil's advocate. Like this dude right here, who's looks like a closer, right? He's a top performing AE, right? Let's just say, or he's a VP of sales. Does he realize when, does he feel like if you give him an email, like you can, like, what if you want to, like, I guess I don't know if like our, and this is, I guess my own thing I struggle with, with this stuff we're doing to decrease form friction is if we're ahead of our buyer. That's mm -hmm. more what I'm asking. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Um, yeah. And we haven't even asked their preference. Like he may be a little old school. He may be on the road. He may be driving for four hours and wants someone to call him, keep him company versus an email. Like there's all those considerations as well. Yeah. What do you think about phone numbers? I mean, more and more people are moving away from them. You know, last week I had someone on here and I think she has her phone number um, in the menu. And I thought it was actually made sense because she wanted, you know, any customer to be able to interact with them any way they wanted. Yeah. Do you feel like having like phone numbers is important still or? I, I think it depends on the markets you serve. So if you're selling to you know, up and coming sales leaders who have never had a landline, maybe not. But if you're in a space like upkeep is where, you know, we're selling to maintenance technology operations type people that have been in business for 25 plus years, like they probably value a phone number. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I don't think it hurts. Right. And it's probably Especially more selling salespeople is kind of where my head was at. Like these yeah. guys are on the phone all day and yet you don't have a way for them to call you. And you're ironically a conversational intelligence product. Like I think what would be cool, right. would be like setting, like if I was gong, I would send the prospect, the transcript of our call using the gong product. So they got an experience of the product that would actually be pretty badass, Dan. Like after the intro call on the demo with gong, if you sent them a link that they could access the call from so they could see what it'd be like that would actually be sick i like that do you know what i'm talking about like because then you could get that product led type growth because the product is so amazing imagine if after the call so you do that right i scheduled my demo on that first call they said hey don't worry on the notes we record it all on gong and we'll send you the recording so you can see what the product would be like if you bought it yep. that would be sick i love that that would actually be really cool do you do this still, by the way? Like, what do you think about this use case? I know why they do it. It's all for SEO. Like, and some, this looks like it's something my team would recommend. Do you think it works though? Like when we're this obvious about it, does it matter or no? I, I think it's helpful. Yeah. Still. It is, isn't it? Yep. I'm actually working on that right now. <laughs> yeah. Cause I mean, you get that bottom of funnel. Like I already know what I want type intent. Like someone's looking for auto dialer software. Yep. Now let's see if it's working for them though. Right. So, Theoretically, the this is more for acquisition, I would say, than activation, right? So they've got their H1. They got their title tag. Let's see if Zoom call transcription. No, we're not ranking in the top 10 for it, though. Isn't that weird? So the way I can usually tell if the strategy is working is I'll take a – I'll go like site. And then I'll go uh, gong.io, right? Zoom call transcription. And then I can see every time they mention Zoom calls, like on a transcription level, and then see if they internally link. But I don't see any content. See, though, they don't really have any content around transcription. Yeah. So that's why they're not raking for it. So it's kind of like living on this. It's 
part of an isolated strategy, unfortunately, instead of like a, okay, we want to essentially drive demand for Zoom call transcriptions. And so we're going to build this base use case page. And then from this, we're going to develop a bunch of content that says like 10 reasons why, right? And so within this subfolder, we might have like a 10 reasons why type post, which they already have an affinity for if you look at their blog strategy. And then we internally link all that content back to this bottom of funnel page. And then we drive demand, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Now, Dan, congratulations. Sorry, Udi. Um, Dan is now the CMO of Gong. Um, what do you do? You got three things you got to do, Dan, to drive growth for an already hyper growth company like Gong. What are you, you going to do? I think the first thing is I'm actually going to push internally for some sort of like try it before you buy it. Because I think to, to your point around um, after the first call, sending that transcript out and letting them play with the product. Um, I think part of it is that they actually get Gong and they get the recording of their first call with Gong. And then they get to play around with it with only that phone call, right? To at least try it, right? It's very limited, but I think it gives them what they need. And then um, the second thing is going to be the top nav on this website. Like, I think that there's a, a, quite a few ways that um, that we can make it easier to find things. Yeah. Uh, so one resources, I think, was a uh, a huge miss in terms of like what Gong Labs is doing. Yeah. Uh, and those insights um, that should be everywhere. There could probably even be a violator at the top of the of the website that you know talks about the most um, recent Gong Labs finding. Yeah, yeah. kind of like uh, like this thing, like we're live because see how like I'm using this to promote the show we're on right now. They yeah. they could have like something like this to promote. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, third is going to be the the personas. So you know if you go under Revintel. Yep. And then um, you know you scroll down a little bit. Um, it's just really hard to find the persona. Like on the version of the website that I'm on, um, you can click what you are and it'll ask you a few questions, but it doesn't actually tell me the story of like why for me. Um, it actually just kind of wants me to get into a demo flow again. So there's an opportunity to tell the story a little bit more um, intentionally for the personas. 100%. But that's, but that's hard because uh, Udi's the man. <laughs> Dan is yeah. not the man. I mean, this is Gong is a powerhouse for sure. No, they've done a great job, and I, I completely agree with you. And I think if I if I were to kind of step in as CMO, pricing, I gotta get pricing into the menu. We do per seat pricing. I'm already a customer of theirs. I transparently do not see a ton of limitations. They're selling a platform. I can't buy one of these and not the other. Like I, I think they have the ability to lead with price, and I think their price is competitive. Like I didn't see their product as expensive. So, like I, I think they can lead with price. Number one, number two. Revenue intelligence is actually limiting, in my opinion, um, because I'm using their product for HR. I'm using their product for customer success. And I think they actually could have a much larger share of their customer's wallet if they actually pivoted out of revenue intelligence. And I think they have a strong enough reputation in sales already that they could pivot out of revenue intelligence without actually losing any market share in revenue intelligence. Um so if you're asking me, like, how do I get another billion for Gong? I stop playing this limiting sales game where I already have complete market awareness, in my opinion. And I move into essentially conversational intelligence um, and win in that category, uh, which I, I think I could actually do. I think they have a better product than anyone else. Um, I think the last thing I do, and you're just like you said, we have the best first party data out there when it comes to to like, what's the content that we can do that no one else can? Because if you look at their blog, the vast majority of it is things that you could have read on Sales Hacker back in the day. And they actually have data that Sales Hacker can never put together, let's say, because their Gong Labs is so epic, but then it's isolated from their strategy instead of being the cornerstone of it. And I think that you could build way more links, you could grow it. And then I'd make sure we're ranking organically, right? Like we have these use cases, but I don't know if it's tied all the way back to an acquisition strategy. And I think these actually would help in the menu, to your point earlier. I think these definitely help you understand the outcomes you could get from the product. So, yeah, man, I think obviously Gong's crushing it, but I think this gives us a couple ideas here 
that we can run with and like really get some market share because they're already doing so well. It's kind of one of those things where I feel like you have to dream even bigger and get them outside that revenue category. Right. Cause I mean, would you argue that everybody who they would want as a customer already knows about them at this point? Yeah. I mean, when they, when they made the revenue intelligence play about a year and a half ago, like it was very deliberate to, to kind of rock that category and own it. And they, and I think to your point, they've done it. They did it. Uh, yeah. yeah. Like hats off, right? Like they pulled that off, which is insane. But I don't know if I don't know if you can keep eating that same elephant, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it gets tougher and tougher, more and more saturated for sure. Yeah, I mean, all they would have to do, and this is like I wish I could do product requests. I was trying to do this. All they would have to do is set up different talk points and triggers. So if they could create, like, if I could create a different instance of, it's so like Gong has uh, universal trigger points, universal talking points, universal things. If I could essentially have a filter that let me do it by business unit so that I could set essentially different things up for my CS team versus my hiring team versus my marketing team versus my sales team, you could take my entire wallet and you already have per seat pricing. So if you only got my sales team, right, I have 10 AEs and 100 employees. And if you, in other words, like what I would argue is they actually have a much smaller percentage of my wallet that if they went towards conversational intelligence, they could get my entire wallet since our whole companies these days are running on Zoom, right? All day I'm on Zoom. My whole meetings are on Zoom. Everybody's on Zoom. Well, none of us really have a way to document that, track that, analyze that. Gone could be that. And that would get them a hundred percent share a wallet in my opinion. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. But has been awesome, Dan. Thanks so much for being on the show. You did amazing. Thanks for having me. Gong's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, you picked the, Brian. You picked the people who are like the billion dollar unicorn. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> this was great. This was great, Daniel. Thank you so much for being on the show. If anyone wants to follow along with your journey uh, at Upkeep and, Upkeep and everything else, um, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, find me on LinkedIn, Daniel Fronin, Twitter, same handle, uh, or on upkeep.com. Hell yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Dan. And uh, that right there is uh, another episode of SaaS Marketing Makeover. Thanks, everybody.